from from goldenjackass.com. Now, of course, the events of the day may be something that we have to touch upon briefly. Um, and, you know, first I'm going to start off with a personal note, which is that for longtime listeners of the show, Liam Sheff uh, apparently passed away today. And uh, we knew that that was coming. That's for certain. And I say I will see you. I will see you soon, brother. That's it. And uh, maybe we'll talk about him a bit more in other shows. But the world keeps spinning and things do keep happening. We have seen what the Tomahawk missiles going into Syria. The first, well, not really the first military engagement of the very young presidency of Donald J. Trump, but, but the first, well, major offloading use of munitions, let's just say. I mean, other things have been sort of surgically arranged, special operations things. This kind of reminds me of what happened, though, the day the Monica Lewinsky story broke and Bill Clinton decided to launch cruise missiles. I don't know why it does, but anyway, it does mean a lot of things. Now, uh, this goes way beyond the hand-wringing that we're seeing there in the U.N. and all of that. I'm not going to go deep into it tonight, not at all, but let's see what Jim Willie thinks about it. Jim, of course, you know, the Hat Trick newsletter, goldenjackass.com, for the most part, we do talk well, finances, we talk about money with Jim. But uh, these sorts of things have an effect on the money, have an effect on the gold, have an effect on the black gold, have an effect on, well, the overall climate, if you will. And I don't mean that thing they keep telling us is changing. Uh, no, not at all. I do mean the climate of the geopolitical structure. And, of course, that involves international banking structures and what things are going to be worth and what's actually happening, et cetera, et cetera. But, again, not for me to really comment deeply on tonight. First off, though, how you doing tonight, Jim? <laughs> I'm, I like to say I'm doing strange. <laughs> I love that answer. I love that answer. Well, I'm, I'm not feeling normal and I haven't for months and months so I'm not fighting it I'm just feeling strange living in a surreal world and uh, here's my quick take on what's happening with Syria and Trump and the US military the neocons are not out of the picture they're working very very hard to keep Trump distracted by putting little landmines on his pathway for his limousine to pass through. They're trying to get him to react to the world situation spinning out of control. But in my opinion, what's happening in Syria is a very concerted, rough attempt to keep Trump distracted away from his economic and financial agenda. Hmm. If he can keep reacting to what's happening in Syria, like, like with an Israeli and a Langley leash attached to his neck, he's going to be pulled away from his infrastructure, economic development, reindustrialization agenda, which is urgent and which, when is put underway with some momentum, is going to knock the neocons flat cold out. So they can't afford that. Mm. Notice something that happened with the recent attacks. I don't want to get into a lot of detail except to say almost all, like I would say 90% or more of the videos uh, regarding ISIS and regarding uh, victims, they're all staged. 90% are staged. I was talking with Cato just this afternoon, and he said, Jim, what they can't stop is a different news source continuing to record after the ISIS video is done recording. And when the ISIS video is done recording, dead people with white blankets or white sheets over them all get up. <laughs> it's a farce. <laughs> It's an absolute farce, Chuck. Well, and and further, bizarre. Furthermore, yeah. furthermore, if these were nerve gas victims, how come they didn't puke their guts out? And how come the people 
handling their bodies work in these hazmat suits. It's all staged just like the beheading and the, the, the absent uh, squirting of blood from the neck cavity. It's mm. all staged bullshit, Chuck. I don't buy it for a minute. I'm not an idiot. But fortunately for Langley, which is behind ISIS, and the Mossad, which is behind ISIS, there are lots and lots of morons in the U.S. public. Here's another little quick hint. When John McCain uh, flaps his gums with some level of approval for what's going on, you can be certain that it was staged by the neocons. He's one of the ugliest fascists ever to walk in the United States. Mm. Well, you know, here here's the other thing, too. Look, this didn't begin with Trump, right? So it wasn't uh, uh, engineered for him. This whole interplay with what's going on in Syria, allegedly, because I've got problems with these videos that you don't that, that you didn't even address. The the origin of these things is a problem to begin with. I don't know what to make of this mess, but fascinating that uh, right before this this whole issue emerges, Kushner rises up, you know, seemingly with the NSC, right? And uh, we know that he's connected to Netanyahu. We know that uh, that there is certainly a, a greater influence over a whole bunch of people in this regime at the moment uh, <laughs> that comes from Langley. And you do accurately point out that, look, as far as I'm concerned, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, you might as well, you know, al Qaeda, excuse me, uh, you know, the ISIS crisis construct, all of this stuff has been manufactured by intelligence agencies for the purpose of actually funding and keeping, you know, look, the, each one of those cruise missiles, million and a half dollars, Jim, <laughs> okay, you know, Somebody and, and they're loaded with silver, so they're consuming silver. That too, that too. I knew you were going to mention that. <laughs> let, let me let me cite something regarding what what Cato told me this afternoon. He said, "Jim, you know these these ISIS compounds, the warehouses, the labs. They were putting together some nerve agents. They were putting together." little grenade launchers with nerve agents on them. They're putting together mortars with nerve agents on them. And the Syrian military didn't know exactly what was going on in those ISIS warehouses, which, by the way, you must also always remember are Langley and Mossad developments. They're, they're, they're agencies. They're offshoots. They're their projects. When the Syrians whacked that warehouse... They didn't know that ISIS was putting together uh, chemical agent munitions, you know, like mortars and, and RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades. Uh, so you, you can't blame the Syrians for a chemical attack, the Syrian military for a chemical attack, when they were blowing up the Langley and Mossad labs that were making nerve gas bombs. So, you know, get a grip, people. You're being lied to on like 80 to 90 percent of the time on all stories. You need to really wake up. I start with a premise, Chuck. Okay, I'm assuming that this is all a lie. Is there anything in here that might possibly be true? That's how I start. And I get deceived very little. Not, not none, but very little. Anyway, let's move on. I, I hate the Syria story, but you know you got to remember what Syria is all about. It's to block the Iranian gas pipeline. They don't want it to go through Syria, to hit the Mediterranean, and to start supplying Western Europe in much the same way that Gazprom did from Ukraine. This is like Ukraine too. It's the same motive to stop an eastern source of gas supply to Europe because they don't want the dollar in the payment. Mm. Russia and Iran don't want the dollar. Doesn't anybody recognize that the wars are all about preventing the, the, the resistance to the dollar? 
Well, I, I tell you one other thing just about this real quick is resistance to the dollar comes up for a good reason here. But one last note. Uh, if you think that Jim Willie's just a yelling guy and, you know, Chuck is crazy because he does conspiracy theory stuff and, and I'll tell you something. The Syrian ambassador to the UN effectively called out the whole thing saying that, you know, it makes no sense what you people are doing because you're attacking the people you were backing. He did that earlier today. Did you see a lot of coverage on that, uh, Jim? Did you see any of that anywhere? Was that blowing up all over the place? Because I, I must have missed it. <laughs> no, I, I, I just go back to the, the very simple story. ICE was developing chemical weapons, and the Syrian military blew it up. Now there are a yeah. lot of other there are a lot of other attacks. There are a lot of uh, U.S. military going after some Russian installations, but I I question whether they were U.S. military or whether they were Langley using U.S. military uniforms and markings mm. because Langley is not U.S. military. Langley is independent mercenary military funded by narcotics. Very big distinction. Oh, yes. Very big. And But here's the thing about it, though, is that it's all a game of finance in the end, too. Because everybody thinks right now they're talking about military stuff. They're ta Actually, here's the fun part. It's really a, a big, grand deception to keep you from understanding. Look, you know how profitable war is? First of all, <laughs> uh, you know, there, there's a reason why independent contractors get paid what they do. There's a reason why, you know, we, we have really no idea what our intelligence budget is. We never have, never will. There's a reason why these people can print money. There's a reason why uh, they do get away with the black operations where all of a sudden, you know, they're not exactly black operations. Really, it's business as usual. All of this stuff going on, and we never really get into that because – for the most part, we are left with this dollar. <laughs> Chuck, this there's dollar. Another, there's another element to this. Okay. No, no Arab lives in the Middle East do lawsuits for wrongful death. Mm, that's true. I've never heard of one before. And you're not going to. They, they don't count. They're considered just part of the landscape. If you talk to a U.S. military person or a Langley person about civilian deaths, they roll their eyes and move on. It's not even a topic of concern. All right. What, what do you say we, we move away from? Yeah, let's, ISIS, let's ISIS do that. Syria. Let's do that because you started talking about, you know, the moving of fuel and all that. And, and one of the things I wanted to get to is, you know, with the, with the fluctuations, in the oil markets, this is going to be, I mean, obviously, whatever goes on, if we go to war, that always does change the way the markets run with fuel because all of a sudden they tell us that, hey, look, we can get fuel from certain places. We can't get it from others. All of that allegedly is supply and demand thing, and it's really a bunch of BS. Isn't that the case, though, that they always use that as an excuse to manipulate the price? And then because the dollar is tied to oil so heavily – this begins to affect the dollar directly. Well, I, I think that about two years ago that the dollar and oil link went away. Uh, I, I really don't buy it. I just checked before we got on. Last week the dollar went up and so did oil. So they're, they're not inversely related at all anymore. Here's a, a bold statement I'm going to make, Chuck. Um, the oil market might be fluctuating. But it's being propped up for the last six months by Wall Street. Wall Street desperately needs the oil price to get up towards 60, and it's just not happening. They desperately needed it to get away from the 40 handle, and they got some success from that. But they're on a timeline here where hundreds of billions of dollars in their credit portfolios for Wall Street banks – are on the line of going bad. You know, in, they're now impaired and they're soon to default. I don't have a, an exact figure, but you know, th this is going on now for quite a while. This is far more than shale oil. The shale mm -hmm. sector is just part of this, part of the equation. But uh, my bold statement is, 
you're going to see the death of the petrodollar, which is well along since 2000, say, 15, 2014. Okay. The death of the petrodollar also involves the ruin of the oil price. They kept the dollar strong by means of a pretty healthy oil market. How long what, did we have oil over $80 and near 100 It was for a few years, and mm -hmm. no one questioned it. Well, now it's down near 50 and struggling to stay above 50. It's dying. And what you're going to see happen is the ruin of Saudi Arabia and the end of almost all the Arab oil monarchies, except for one. And that's Oman. I tend to think that uh, Qatar is going to hang around for a while because they're so dedicated to advanced LNG systems and they're working with Russia with respect to that. But can you imagine a Middle East landscape where the Saudi kingdom is gone, where Kuwait is gone, where Bahrain is gone? Can you imagine that? It's going to be very different, and they're going to struggle to have any kind of useful formal government. And the voice jokes and said they're going to go back to the Bedouin society. They're going to become goat herders because the wealth from the nations, those monarchies, it's been stolen. It's been stolen by their, their royals. They've got property all across Western Europe and North America. They've got gold accounts that they're struggling to prevent from being stolen. Most of their gold accounts in Switzerland have been stolen. They've hidden some in Germany, ironically in Deutsche Bank. Uh, so the Arabs, <laughs> the Arab royals have their money all over the place outside of the Gulf region. So when those monarchies go, go kaput, what are you going to have left? They go back to Bedouin societies. Goat herders. Okay, so you're going to see a lot of change coming. And I fully expect that they're going to have difficulty keeping oil near the $50 level because the economies are not in good shape. They're not anywhere near the growing status. The U.S. economy has been stuck somewhere around minus 4 and minus 5% for growth. Ever since Lehman, I'm talking about an annual vicious recession. Right. And if you don't believe it, just take a look at things. Very interesting, constant type, difficult to defraud uh, statistics like electricity usage, railway freight, um, trucking freight, withholding taxes for income taxes. They're all way down. Money supply, money velocity is, is way down. That's evidence that QE is failing. So, you know, you could talk all you want about fluctuating oil markets and will they keep it up. No, they're not. They're, they're preventing a massive death scenario, D-E-A-T-H, from the debt, D-E-B-T, failing. And, and, you know, it took a Herculean effort in the last four or five, six months to prevent oil from going down and staying down below 40. They did very well. I give them credit. That does not mean that they're going to rescue the oil-related credit portfolio. There is something that's happened, though, and uh, SRS Rocco, he's a, an analyst buddy of mine. We don't have you know regular and frequent contact, but what I do is I, I borrow his work to, to cite it because it's so excellent. He made a, an article a couple months ago to the effect that the, the, uh, the break-even price for the oil sector is down about 10 bucks from where it was five to six months ago. So they've cleaned out some of the bad projects, the bad items on the portfolio for Wall Street, the energy portfolio, and they've defaulted on some of it. They restructured some of it. They you know, the banks took a bit of a loss on some of it. They, they had some of the investors eat some of the losses on some of it. And what, what they came out with is a slightly lower break-even level. But it's still not enough. 
They need, instead of like a, an $80 oil price, they need something like a $65 oil price. They're not going to get it. And here's one key reason why. It has nothing to do with Saudi Arabia and their depleting, fast depleting oil reserves. Iran, as part of their oil, I'm sorry, as part of their nuclear, the Iran nuclear deal, mm -hmm. um, they don't have any quotas. There are no limits. They're, they're given a free reign. Go ahead, produce all you want. I just read something last week that all 80 oil tankers from Iran are now sold. They had floating inventory. They're all sold. And now they're going balls to the wall, producing oil, producing gas, no limits. They don't give a flying shit about OPEC limits and requirements. They're producing and they're bringing in money. So why do you think U.S. government is saying stupid things like Iran was responsible in part for 9-11, so their European huge accounts are liable for confiscation. This is insane what we're doing. And the backfire is going to be enormous in the next several months. We cannot blame willy-nilly 18 different countries for a responsibility on 9-11 and then go steal their assets. You can't mm. do that. Well, you know, and on that, even in this recent uh, occurrence, I'm already hearing them trying to tack Iran onto the responsibility regarding Syria, the regime, the Assad regime, all of this kind of stuff. That, that, that you know, not only is it the backing of Russia, but it's the backing of Iran. So maybe they'd be liable for what you know, compensation regarding uh, you know, uh, being punished for war crimes. They would have you know, obviously their accounts frozen and this kind of thing too, if they were found to be a part of that as well, wouldn't? Well, yeah, except there's some truth in that. We've got 20 years of history where Iran and, and Syria have been pretty strong allies. And right. now in the last five years, Iran and the Shiite uh, sector of the Iraqi government have been rather well connected. So the U.S. is very concerned that there's going to be an, a triangle forming of Iran, Iraq, and Syria that will be very, very formidable and allied with Russia, linking up to the gas prom pipelines. Mm. Okay, so that's a concern. I'm not concerned about, you know, Iraq, Iran's involvement in Syria uh, with respect to, um, you know, confiscating or freezing assets held in Western European banks. I'm concerned about the lunatic, fabricated premise that they were involved in 9-11. My gosh, Saudi Arabia was barely involved. Their involvement had very little to do beyond Bandar, Prince Bandar Bush being a, a preparatory front for the, the, the 12 or 20, whatever it was, young kids, young Arabs, young Saudis, the Wahhabis, Mm -hmm. who were involved with, with pilot training. Uh, ba Prince Bandar was hired by Langley to produce a, a false front of Saudi involvement. And then we turned on the Saudis. Do we not turn on anybody? My gosh, the U.S. government with its current neocon leadership is one of the most atrocious, vicious, violent, and betraying in, in modern history. Oh, yeah. I, I point this out all the time. You know, we turn on our clients continuously. You know, uh, remember Saddam Hussein was a client of ours, right? Uh, and then Pop, we had to Papa go to Bush. Papa Bush, you know, and, and we had to turn on him. You know, he was useful during the Iran-Iraq conflict, wasn't he? Uh, you know, but then it was time to clean him out. And then uh, we had to go do it twice, really. So why not? And, and remember, that was another willy-nilly blaming for 9-11. Hey, look, they harbor terrorists, right? Uh, they've got weapons of mass destruction. See, this is why this is resonating with me today. And the whole weird thing is, that we're doing this at the same time. Now I'm going to, I'm going to really shift gears on you because we have a Fed rate hike increase during this time when things are so dangerous with this international thing going on, right? How is that going to impact things? 
and and at the same time, I'm also seeing, you know, hey, let's let's talk about the dollar for a second. Two weird things. Uh, you see the plastic money that's about to come out. What what is what is this all about, man? I mean, are are we living in Disneyland or what? We've been in Disneyland since the early 1970s, uh, when we broke the the uh, Bretton Woods Gold Standard. Right. You know, this needs to be taught in American schools. It, it's really not. Uh, I got on my brother's case about a year ago when he admitted that when he got his bachelor's degree in economics, he did not take a single course in gold. He said it was never mentioned throughout the entire bachelor's program. I said, was there even a, an, an, an offered course about gold standard, its consequences, and history of money. And he said, I don't remember any. Okay, so here's what I think is going on with the Fed rate hike. Uh, I, I'd like to do a preface about what happened in December of 2015. A little over a year ago, they did what I call a fake rate hike. What they did was they said, we're going to raise it 25 basis points. But if you look closely, a month later, two months later, there was only about an eight basis point increase in the effective Fed funds rate. So they didn't get the 25 basis points. They got eight. Well, why was that? It's because they undermined their own rate hike. What they did was a, a clever move regarding the reverse repo. I don't want to get into a long discussion, but repo is is, is a, a window for repurchase where the Fed goes in and says, we're going to purchase Wall Street Bank's treasury bonds. Not a lot. We're going to repurchase some of them. Repo. And we're going to give you cash. Uh, and, and you're going to get some of these bonds off your hands. But a reverse repo is the other way around. What they do is they say to Wall Street Bank's, we're going to give you we're going to do the other, we're going to do the exact opposite. We're going to give you back treasury bonds and we're going to take your cash. And, mm. you know, it doesn't sound logical until you think why they do such a thing in terms of leverage. If Wall Street banks have a good deal of cash lying around from, say, the bond carry trade, where they use futures contracts to borrow with free money and invest in treasury bonds, take take the 30-fold leverage from the futures and cash out every three months or so, they've got a lot of cash. So the Fed says, we want your cash. We're going to give you treasury bonds because you can leverage them to the heavens. Okay? So okay. the reverse repo enabled the Wall Street banks to increase their leverage to something in the neighborhood of 100 to 1 on their treasury bonds. Okay, that's the preface. I think we have a few risks here for Trump. One is they just halt QE without any kind of advertising. They just cut back. Not completely. Maybe they, they, they cut back in a severe way. So after a while you wonder, hey, what's going on? Uh, the 10-year Treasury is climbing up. It's approaching 3%. How did that happen? The Fed didn't make any announcements. So how'd that happen? Well, the answer is simple. They sabotaged Trump by holding back on the volume of QE with the bond purchases. The second risk is they get some kind of an international deal. I'm talking about the banker cabal, the, the Western European, British, and United States central banks right. get together, and, and they organize, say, with Russia and China, just among the bankers, where they say, Look, let's all get together on this. Let's let's move to say a gold trade note uh, for trade payment and get away from the Treasury bill and force Trump to launch a new dollar for domestic only purposes within the United States. And you get away from a nation using the global reserve currency because that is heretic. You can't do things like that. We've been doing it for forty years. The other, the other risk is that the Fed would raise interest rates and do so in an advertised 
and forewarn sequence. So it looks like we're getting that. And it sounds like sabotage. Well, one, one question I have here is, is, is this similar to the parallel type of money system that the Chinese used to gain the leverage that they did? I mean, uh, you know, where, where they have like one currency, which is very much invested in U.S. treasuries and then seemingly another. Is, is that what, what we're looking at here? That, that type of thing emerging in the U.S.? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think it's going to be a, a lot sharper division of oh. internationally held dollars versus domestic U.S. dollars. And the domestic takes on a completely different look, completely different uh, structural format, like treasury dollars instead of Federal Reserve note. And it would be subject to the vagaries and fluctuations of its own fundamentals, which are rotten as hell. And that's where you see coming into four the $550 billion annual trade deficit that the U.S. has, if they have a domestic-only dollar that's floated, it's going to see regular and frequent 30% devaluations. I mean, like every six months, Chuck. So so this is the purpose of this plastic dollar that I'm looking at, that uh, they, they allegedly are going to put, like, Neil Armstrong on now and, and this I, kind of thing? I have no idea what your plastic dollar is, and I... I, I don't want to be rude, but I don't give a shit. Okay, it's fine. I was just curious because it just, I saw these design proposals and I'm saying to myself, why would you completely change the uh, the look and everything else of the dollar? But if you're going to have a parallel currency where they're both, you know, generally referred to as the dollar, but one is, you know, a Federal Reserve note and the other is a U.S. dollar, which actually has two different uh, functions, that would change things dramatically, wouldn't it? Yeah, but remember, six to nine months ago, there was another series of different-looking dollars with, uh, what's Roosevelt, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt on one and Tesla on another, the $100 bill. It's all right. bullshit. That's why I say, I don't know what your plastic dollar is, but I don't give a shit. Okay. Okay? All right. Because I think in three months, it's not going to be around anymore. You're not going to care about it. And I never did in the first place. Okay, there are three hikes that are mentioned by the Fed for this year. And I think we may have more coming. And here's what I think might be behind it. They're getting worried sick at the Fed over the rising dollar and its vulnerability to a correction. Uh, I'm looking at a, a dollar chart right now. And you can see in 2015 and 16, it was pretty much between 95 and 100. But in late 2016, coming into January, it went up to 103.8. Okay, it's not that the dollar is strong. It's that QE has wrecked the world economy and really laid waste to a lot of foreign currencies. Let me repeat that. The dollar is not strong. The Fed's monetary policy of printing money like an African nation or a, a South American hyperinflation nation, it has wrecked the global economy by raising a cost structure, followed by ruining profit margins, which then destroys capital and you get, you know, warehouses full of liquidating capital, liquidating machines, widget makers. That's, that's the common term in, in economic textbooks. Mm. The factories have gone quiet. It's because the dollar is, is being supported for its government debt, U.S. government debt, by the printing press and QE and the result in a vicious feedback loop is to destroy capital. Only a few economic analysts are out there with, with their heads straight on this vicious feedback loop effect of ruined capital. And I'm one of them. I've been talking about it for four years. Right. There are only a couple others that are talking about this. But it is the cost economically of doing what we're doing to support the U.S. government debt. We're encouraging hedging with commodities. And now 
in the last year or so, year and a half, you're seeing a different phenomenon take place that a number of commodities have fallen in price led by crude oil. And my answer to that is it doesn't mean that the dollar is having a revival. It means they've completed the project of wrecking the global economy. Mm. Okay, so they're nervous about supporting the dollar. And they think that, you know, with a, a whiplash effect, you know, going from, you know, 98 up to 103 plus, it might pull it back down to 98 with some downward momentum. But I do believe that it will not be too difficult to maintain a 98 to 102 range for a while. What they're going to have more difficulty, Chuck, with is avoiding the non-dollar platforms and the non-dollar trade payment systems that are coming. They're already working. They're already filtering into the system. This is how the dollar loses its prestige, loses its momentum, loses its acceptance, loses its global hegemony. Mm. It's the non-dollar platforms and vehicles. Well, now, isn't part of that the fact that a whole lot of nations that nobody ever bothers to look at on the globe or map or whatever uh, are, are starting to come out with new gold-backed currencies, looks like to me, and... Well, gee, won't those be a lot, uh, a lot more reliable as instruments for purchase internationally than anything we're printing at, you know, light speed for no apparent reason and wrecking the world economy with? I mean, wouldn't that be about the, the right solution? Although, you know, we're not hearing about it from the major nations that we usually hear about it from, but there are many different, uh, smaller ones that are turning around and, trying to back their currency with gold at this point. Is that is that not the case, or am I seeing something wrong here? I think I, I don't want to you know, disagree with you with, with any kind of uh, force here, but I think what you might be referring to is plans by several nations. Because I, I, I don't know of a single gold-backed currency right now, but I know of several countries. I'll, I'll, I'll just ring off a list. Yeah, no, the, these are all proposals. You're right. I, right. They're proposals. But what I'm saying is, yeah. since we're seeing that happen and they're actually, you know, letting that come out into the, the, the public domain, so to speak, that means that, uh, you know, plans are generally underway. You know, they don't do these things when it's just an idea floating in the air. They're probably underway with the, with these instruments and developing them and they probably already got them pretty much ready to go. They're just deciding when to release them usually when they make a statement like that publicly. Yeah, I, I just don't know the timing, and uh, for some of them they could be trial balloons. For others, they, they might be little trials to see who the Americans murder in their financial group and government. Oh, that's, okay. what we, that's what we do. We murder them and say, oh, he had a plane accident. Yeah, right. Okay, the irony is pretty thick because Zimbabwe is working on, on a gold reserve bank. Uh, right. They're not talking about a gold-backed currency, the Zimbabwe dollar, often called the Zim dollar. They're not yet talking about that. They're talking about a gold reserve bank because they produce gold. You know, one of the greatest paradoxes out here among us in the West is that the African nations are loaded with resources. Many of them are producing gold, and they don't have the fucking wits together to produce a gold-backed currency and eliminate their debt problems. Well, a guy named Gaddafi had that idea, I think. Yes, yes. The West does not tell that story well, but it's looking to me increasingly like maybe 80% of the motive to get rid of him was his movement on a second pass, not the first, but a second pass, to produce the Arab gold dinar. And right. use it at, at least among northern African nations for required payment for their oil. And U.S. said, well, we'll have none of that. We're going to kill you and steal your 144 tons of gold and make it next to impossible for your country to recover that gold held in the London banks. So where's the war crime there? Let me just rattle off here, Chuck, what some of the uh, gold-backed currencies are going to be. Start okay. off 
Start off with the Chinese ruble. Oh, God, that's funny. The, the Chinese RMB. That was good. That was good, though. I like that. The Chinese ruble. <laughs> well, you know, you know okay, it, it's kind of funny, but, uh, you know, it could be a Freudian slip because I have the two of them together. Right. The Russian ruble and the Chinese RMB might be joined together at the hip. They might both work together and, and come out at the same time in a, a mutual launch and each say, we've got 30,000 tons of gold to back this currency. Each of them, not together. Each has 30,000, 60,000 total. Okay, that's for starters. And I think that would undermine, underpin, underpin and fortify the entire Eurasian trade zone and change their entire practice of trade payments where they could go to the gold trade note, which I'd like to talk about a, a little bit later. Um, okay, here's another one. We mentioned the Arab gold dinar. Here's another one. The Germans, they've got the, the Dutch, they've got the Austrians, they've got probably Finland too, uh, well on board for whatever the Germans want to do. And I've got a German source that tells me that they're working behind the scenes on a gold-backed Nordic euro. Okay. Let's back off, head to the, US, uh, the American hemisphere. Uh, before the murder, or was it just a heart attack? Now, before the murder of Venezuelan leader Chavez, you know, he was not a nice guy, but we don't have the right to kill him. Okay? State murder seems to be the right for the exceptional nation, the fascist U.S. Okay, before the murder of Chavez... The Panamanian government was working toward a what they called a Central American dollar. It was going to be gold backed. Now, if you think they don't have much gold, you're wrong. They had 250 tons of gold in Panama. If you think that's not a lot, you're wrong. If you think it's a small amount, you're wrong. Panama has 3 million people. U.S. has 300 million. Simple napkin math, 100 times larger. So if they have 250 tons of gold... How would the United States like to have 25,000 tons of gold? That's the ratio. Not only do the, the Panamanians have a lot of gold for their little society and little economy, they have 86 million pounds of, of copper plates. They're doing extensive mining in southern Panama near the Colombian border. It's loaded with metal deposits. Okay, so they, you know, have their royalties and, and the government gets, what, 20% of what, what is mined. And they've got 86 million pounds of copper plates. That's, that's a few warehouses. Wow. Okay, Panama was going to lead the movement with Ecuador, Panama, and Venezuela to have a gold-backed dollar. But Chavez got murdered. Okay, moving on. Mexico is the world's biggest producer of silver. They have been for quite a while. They might very well come up with a Mexican silver-backed peso. The missing element here is Canada and the United States. Canada stupidly followed the Wall Street lead and sold all their gold reserves. But Canada has an advantage. They could replace it. In a matter of 10 years, they could lease gold and, and sell into the lease and replace their gold in that, in that way, in a, in a clever way. You know, they could use a little financial engineering, pay a small fee, get it done. <clears throat> right. The United States is, is more stuck. Uh, they can, the United States cannot come up with a gold-backed currency, Chuck, for a very simple reason. They don't have the industry yet. They need to do industrialization first. They need to bring back the outsource industry before we do any kind of a gold-backed currency because with a $550 billion annual trade deficit, at the current $1,300 gold price, the United States would lose 13,000 tons of gold in the first year. Now, if we reindustrialize and do something clever... Maybe we can offset the trade deficit with a very serious inflow of currency. So that the current account deficit, which is like the big brother to the trade deficit, 
The current account deficit might be closer to zero, and the forfeited goal would be less because the forfeited goal is a function of the current account deficit, not just a trade deficit. We actually sell a lot of property. We sell a lot of bonds. But notice in the last two years, three years, we haven't sold jack shit in treasury bonds. We're doing it almost all, like 90% of the bonds being purchased in the US, for, for U.S. government debt. It's being done through the interest rate swap derivative, fabricated demand. That does not alleviate the current account deficit, which is still over a trillion dollars I'm sorry, the, the federal deficit over a trillion dollars, the current account deficit in the neighborhood of 500 to 600 billion dollars a year. Okay, we cannot do that. I left out one other nation. We might actually see a gold backed Turkish lira. Uh, Turkey's got a lot of gold. Mm. They've got a thousand years of history of gold, just like India. India could come out with a, with an Indian gold rupee. That could very well happen. So, you know, add them all up and you got Eight different currencies, not counting the dollar. If they all come out with a currency with a gold with gold backing and the U.S. does not, what country I ask you is odd man out? Huh. It's kind of easy to see, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And there's another very important point. You're not going to see any one country. I, I came out with a critique this morning, uh, a public article where. Uh, the analyst of, of twominds.com, Charles Hugh Smith, came out with what I regarded to be a very poor thesis in his article about the lack of viability of the gold standard. <clears throat> he actually cited a, a mythical co country called Slobovia and its mythical Zatlu uh, currency and said, well, you know, if they come out with a currency like that, it's gold back before you know it. If they have a surplus, they wreck their export trade. If they have a, uh, these are these are the lessons learned from a single nation doing it. If they have a big surplus, uh, they ruin their export trade from a rising currency. If they have a big deficit, they lose all their gold instantly, from from you know for, the forfeiture to all the foreign account holders who hold that debt, that deficit. Okay. 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 He misses the major point. There is no one country that's going to come out like that because they're all waiting to come out together in what's called the Eurasian Trade Zone. It's also called the Eurasian Economic Union, but I do not want another EEUU. We've already got United States and European Union. There's a two EE, two EU, one's EU, one's EEU. Uh, we don't need an EEUU. Come on. Let's call it the Eurasian Trade Zone, please. Okay. Eurasian Trade Zone is linking together the BRICS nations, the former Soviet republics, China, Southeast Asia, Russia, and emerging market nations. Yes, they have critical mass. That's been my point in the Hattrick letter for over two years. The gold standard will come back, will make its initial position. When these nations have critical mass, Mr. Smith, it's not going to be Slobovia. It's going to be a hundred nations. And then the United States and some of its crippled Western European allies are going to be odd men out. Well, see, and that leads, be, well, that leads to an interesting question, though, Jim, because when we watch Trump recently meeting with, you know, with, with the Chinese, uh, I forget what they call him. Is he a prime minister? Is he a president? I forget. Premier. But premier, premier. Premier. Thank you. Uh, the Chinese premier. Now, he's sitting there acting as though he has, you know, some sort of leverage. He's going to make a deal. In reality, if, if they're, I mean, if you're aware of this, they must be aware of this. The premier must be aware of this. We're not dealing from a position of strength when we're dealing with China at this point. In any way, shape, or form, it's got very little to do with, you know, oh, gee, you know, it's products and they've sent us too many cheap products. That ship has sailed. We're into a whole other area here, and, and we're, we're dealing from a position of weakness. Uh, no matter who's in that office, whether it's Trump or whoever, uh, the fact is we got, we got nothing to bargain with, if uh, I'm that, understanding you. I wouldn't agree entirely with that. We've got two things to bargain with. First of all, China is, is the creditor, okay? They hold a trillion dollars worth of U.S. government debt. 
And, and not much in the news is the fact that Japan also holds a trillion dollars in U.S. government debt. Right. But we, we tend to think the Chinese are, are the, real wealth, the real wealthy Asian player. It's Japan. Japan has $20 trillion in their pension programs. We stole a trillion dollars three years ago from the Japanese government pension fund. We're trying to borrow or uh, commandeer another trillion to do U.S. infrastructure projects. But the U.S. The U.S. has two things that we bring to the table in order to resist any kind of... Uh, Power plays by China. We have a military. We have an overrated military. Mm, that we do. <laughs> we have a depleted military. We have a military with more soldiers wearing prosthet prosthetics than the history of mankind. We also have a pretty big consumer market. The Chinese are not prepared yet to say... We're going to just walk away from the U.S. market for exports, and we're going to go, go it alone with the Pacific Rim and Southeast Asia and Russia. We'll be fine. No, they're not ready for that. They still are working to build up, uh, and with some success, their middle class, their domestic demand. They're building up relations with Taiwan. Ironically, they're building relations with Thailand. Korea, they got some friction with Korea. Uh, they're working with uh, other nations like Indonesia, Malaysia. These are very populated countries with expanding middle class. Okay, so China does not want to walk away from the U.S. market. It's as simple as that. They want to start working more constructively with the United States because very few Americans are aware that if you make a list of the top 20 U.S. cities, urban centers, China owns 30% of the commercial property. They've been cashing in their treasury bonds and buying commercial property. Right. They don't want to, to be the big enemy, the, bu the, you know, the bugaboo. They don't want the United States to paint them as the villain and, and have very serious trade war and serious sanctions against Chinese banks and Chinese investments. No. Like like in Dallas, they own like 15 different buildings. In New York, they own a third of Manhattan. Right. They own the J.P. Morgan headquarter building. They, they, they own, I think they got rid of, they, they bought the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, but they I think they had to yield it. Uh, something happened. It didn't work out. But uh, let, let me get to a, a very important point regarding gold, gold standard, etc., uh, well, well, hold that thought, ahead. Jim, because you know what? We're going to wind up up against okay. the break here, and I don't want to break up what you're going to say about this. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it is interesting that you bring up Japan, uh, because in a recent discussion about Japan, I, you know, and I want to get your views on this. It might seem a little disjointed to some people, but I want to get your views on David Rockefeller, the, you know, the, the, the recent death, uh, and all of that, because people have represented this to me as something that is significant. Uh, in, in, in a financial sense. And I'm not so sure that it is. Now, look, I, I sometimes will throw questions at you or other people on this show to provoke responses. And, uh, so far I think I've done pretty well. <laughs> so, uh, I do appreciate everything you've had to say. And I, I think we need to pay special attention to what you're going to talk about regarding, uh, you know, the, the, the future of gold effectively, because this, once again, I think is going to, you know, at this moment, there's a lot of paper, there's a lot of digital this and that, and the third thing that uh, that people are concerning themselves with. I mean, I've never even begun to ask you about things like, you know, cryptocurrencies and stuff like that. Good luck, and let us all be seeking the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. 
Second hour begins here of the Ocelli Effect. Jim Willie is with me, goldenjackass.com, the hat trick newsletter. You need to, if, if you've never gone over to goldenjackass.com, go over there. It's definitely distinctive, it has that green background, and yes, indeed, a jackass is there in the graphics. Uh, we've told the story about why it's called goldenjackass.com on this show before. Look in the archives. I'm not going to waste Mr. Willie's time with that, but... The uh, the idea of gold is definitely in the discussion this evening. Of course, we've also brought up copper and oil and a few other commodities, if you will. But uh, Mr. Willie is explaining to us a lot about what's happening, what's emerging, what may emerge, and the leverage that uh, that is you know in play here regarding the <laughs> U.S. dollar, which I do have to chuckle at at this point because uh, we're in a position. Where quite honestly, I'm feeling like I I, I need to have I, I don't I don't have much I, I don't have any possession of physical gold, but uh, but I've got to tell you that uh, I'm at the very least grabbing onto anything silver I can get my hands on, um, because uh, I feel as though we're entering an interesting time where that is going to retain its value. Uh, while everybody else shuffles paper and digits on computers. So, and those things I think will just evaporate <laughs> very quickly. And, uh, anyway, but enough of my views. Jim, you know, you were just about to get into this discussion about, uh, about the gold standard and, uh, and, and where you think things are headed. And I didn't want it cut off, uh, by the break. So please go ahead and continue. <clears throat> Uh, pardon me. Uh, Charles Hugh Smith came out with this article. I, I mentioned it before, how I offered a rather harsh critique, rebuttal, with a number of solutions that he overlooked. He seems to think that the other nations of the world cannot come out with a gold-backed currency because it would be too difficult. It would... Well, I mentioned before that if a critical mass of uh, Russia, China, Eurasian trade zone nations, Southeast uh, Asia, Pacific Rim, BRICS nations, and emerging market nations come together, they might have 60 to 70 percent of the global economy, and they might begin to call the shots. But I think he's wrong about the avenue by which the gold standard will come. It's not going to be from a single nation announcing a gold currency. It's probably going to come in through the trade payment system. And here is why. The West controls the computers and the financial markets. They control the paper money mechanisms. Mm. The Asian nations, call it the East plus emerging markets, they have the majority of manufacturing. They have the majority of industry. They actually have greater reserves accumulation than the West. So they have control of what we use to pay for our imports. Now, what would happen if India says, United States and Canada, I know you like our clothing, our textiles, uh, we don't want a treasury bill anymore. We want a gold trade note. What would happen if China says to the Saudis, uh, we'll, we'll pay you for your oil, but we're going to get it all financed through the gold trade note. We'll do an intermediate step with RMB currency for a few months, but just until the gold trade note is ready and working. Okay. Wow. Okay, so... The avenue will be from the gold trade note in trade payments, which the West does not control because the West does not have the majority of industry. Now, what happens after that? Stage two. Well, all these countries are going to be required to gather up a little bit of gold to pay for the Eastern and Asian and emerging market nation output, and they're not going to need the Treasury bill anymore. They're going to need to have some gold accumulation. So how is that going to affect their bank reserves? Out go the Treasuries, in comes gold. What's mm. the third stage? 
<clears throat> pardon me, the third stage, the actual gold-backed currencies. And I mentioned a bunch of them, Arab dinar and Nordic euro, uh, Chinese RMB, Russian ruble, maybe the Indian rupee, the Turkish lira, the Mexican peso, Central American dollar. Ooh. Okay. Like Mr. Smith, you don't start with Slobovia and a gold-backed currency, the Zetlu. You start with gold trade notes from 117 BRICS alliance nations that have critical mass. Okay. That's a very important point. You know, let me take this opportunity, Chuck. You mentioned gold and silver. You're stacking some silver. Uh, when I started this newsletter... Uh, in 2004. By the way, this month is my 13th anniversary, so pretty happy about that. It's gone, it's gone a long way, quite a ride. When I started it, I, I got a lot of questions right out of the gate in 2004 and five. What percentage should I have gold? What percentage should I have silver? How do you allocate? And should I even have some platinum? Right. And I started out with just my own opinion because I, I was alone. I, I had a couple of smart friends, but I was alone. I didn't have a group like I do now with, with eight or nine colleagues, including The Voice and Euro Raj and London Paul. I didn't, I didn't have them before. On my own, I said, I really think the lift, the gains that you're going to see in silver will be at least double what you see for gold, I would recommend 80% silver, 20% gold, because look at it this way. Central banks own a lot of gold, but they don't own much of any silver. So on a supplied side, silver wins. Industry does not require a big demand for gold, but they require an enormous demand for silver. So on the demand side, silver wins. Hmm. Silver wins demand, silver wins supply. And furthermore, the demand is inelastic. By that I mean if you raise the silver price double, you're not going to affect the demand. You're really not because the, the, the silver is being used in, in enormous volumes but in small amounts per unit of the product. Mm. By that I mean you might have a product that sells for – $86, but it only includes 70 cents of silver. And now it's going to be a dollar fifteen, a dollar twenty, dollar sixty. That's not going to affect the price of the $85, $90 item. It's a minor component, but there are going to be millions of those sold. So you have inelastic demand and you have also inelastic supply. I don't want to get into that right now, it's a little more complex. Inelasticity is a fascinating fascinating concept within precious metals uh, well it makes sense because look uh you know there, there used to be lots of gold in uh, certain types of uh, computer towers and things like that um i don't think that that is so now but at one point the older uh, uh ones contained a certain amount of gold and even with something as high priced as gold it, it did affect the price but not very much of of the components, it seemed like. And silver, I think, would be even worse because, look, if you look at a gram of silver today, I don't know, maybe it's around 70 cents, something like that for a gram. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, let, let's just use that as a marker. If it was 70 cents today and then, uh, you know, tomorrow the ounce price goes up to $40, uh, it would only be, you know, a $1.50 or whatever uh, to, to put that uh, gram of silver into the component, right? I mean, that's – it just makes sense. It's not that big of a, a, a shift when it comes to use unless it's on a mass scale, right? I, I tend to agree, and, and even the cruise missile – has something like 100 pounds of silver in it. If the silver price doubles, you think the demand for U.S. military purchases of, of cruise missiles is going to decline? I don't think so. Well, no, I mean, they're, they're one and a half. What you have to look at yeah. is the percentage in the product cost due to silver. And it's amazing. In one product after another, I saw an article a few years ago, it was amazing. The percentages of silver within the cost for the item are usually between a half a percent and five percent. So you double it, and you're really not affecting the overall product price. That's called il inelastic demand, right. and it's going to continue. Furthermore, silver has very few replacements. 
you know, I look at the periodic table of elements. I, I did pretty well in, in advanced placement chemistry in high school. I took AP chemistry, AP history of Russia, and AP calculus. Uh, so here I was, I graduated from high school age 17, a year old, early, and I had a ton of college credit, mostly from calculus, but, <clears throat> oh, I forgot my point. I'm very sorry. I, I got, I got veered off. Uh, well, no, no problem. I, I, I understand. We were, we were talking about, you know, physical possession and you had talked about the percentages and why it matters and how silver oh, you, yes, you thought. Oh, periodic table. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, okay. I remember. I remember. I, I ha sorry to interrupt you, but I, my own, my, my brain kicked in. Um, in the periodic table of the elements, there's a unique column. Uh, it's a stable column. It's not on the edge. It's not on the left end. It's not on the right end. You know, it's not where sodium is. It's not where chloride is. Chlorine, sodium chloride, and salt. That's why it dissolves so easily. They're, they're both rather unstable as in ionic form. Gold, silver, and copper are all in the same column. The lightest one is copper. It's, it's pretty light. You, you hold a copper plate in your hand, you go, well, that's not all that heavy. You hold a silver one, yeah, that's a little heavy. You hold gold, it, wow, that is notably heavier. Okay, they're unique. They're very unique. But uh, I think people need to start paying very close attention to the risks of having too much invested in paper assets. Um, you, you have the Fed, you have Wall Street, and the U.S. government is in full support of this. They're propping up the bond market. They're propping up the stock market. They're doing their dead level best for the public not to wake up. They don't want the public to wake up and say, hey, wait a minute. We get a vicious recession, but the stocks are doing very well. And you, you can only sell so much the bullshit of the Fed valuation model where the true stock prices and the P.E. ratios are derived from the interest rate, which is artificially pushed down. Therefore, the stocks are artificially pushed up. The Fed does not have in its charter stock support, but they don't get any flack because the public likes it. Okay, people need to be aware of the huge risk for a rather severe decline in the stock market that could actually be organized by Wall Street like they did in 2008. Mm. They load up with S&P shorts and they load up with leveraged futures S&P shorts and they load up with leveraged squared option future shorts. So if you get a 20% decline, you're going to find Wall Street banks showing a rather hefty profit in the following quarter, and they're going to have trouble hiding it because they're going to engineer this crash, this decline. Now, it used to be an old adage that made a lot of sense and had a lot of followers. You buy low and you sell high. That's lost. That concept is not part of the vernacular in the U.S. investment public. They look to see what's rising and continuing to rise, and they climb on board like with Apple stock. Okay, This is not how you make money. You make money by buying low and selling high. Buy what's kept down. I like to think, and I think this is very true, that the gold price is a coiled spring with multiple years and pressure. The U.S. dollar is being propped, and it just cannot stay up. I don't care that many other foreign currencies are in worse shape than the dollar. I think all the paper fiat currencies are in trouble. And when you start to see this, as I mentioned, as I described, this gold trade note requirement pushing out the Treasury bill as a, as a, you know, a standard feature in trade payment, and, and add to that, the Chinese paying RMB for Saudi and Gulf region oil, you're going to see a very different look and reputation and sentiment toward the dollar. So <clears throat> I would sell what's propped up with your stocks and bonds, and that includes the muni bonds and, and other corporate bonds, 
and I would load up on gold and silver. You, you sell what they're propping up artificially and thank them. And then you buy as much as you can get your hands on, gold and silver bars and coins. And you thank them for the discount. The voice told me at Christmas that he was aware of a very large transaction that took place in Dubai. And he told me, do not mention any more details than that, uh, except that it was on the order of a $100 million gold purchase. I saw the bin. It was a rather large bin loaded to the brim with gold bars. And he said, Jim, the price on this was $2,100 an ounce. He said, you have a premium of roughly 80%. Now, I, I got responses from clients saying, but wait a minute, I bought three gold coins last week at a dealer. I only paid, you know, spot price plus a small premium. And I said, yeah, why don't you go back and ask them that for, for the sale to you of $5 million worth of gold coins. Tell them that you've got an armed guard in a limousine out back, and you've got a couple of suitcases filled with $100 bills. you got $5 million, and you'd like to buy these gold coins, $5 million worth, and you're going to give this guy 48 hours to load up his inventory call up all his dealer friends and arrange for all those stacks and stacks of gold coins. Okay. And let me know if you're able to buy more than six. Ah. Okay, so when you introduce volume into the equation, you find out what the real price is. Good luck well, buying more than six from that gold. You might be able to buy 13. But I don't think you're going to be able to buy... Anything like 420. So, so you're saying basically, I mean, if you're going over, say, $20,000 worth of gold, um, you're, you're not going to get the same value that you would, I mean, approximately, right? Well, I don't think you're going to get the product. That's my point. Hmm. I, you, you said 20000 I, I did not mention 20000 I mentioned $5 million. Oh, no, no, I, I know you mentioned five million, but what I'm saying is that if you're looking at, you know, between six and 13 gold coins, uh, you know, that, that could easily run $20,000, let's just say, depending on what size they are and all that. Uh, let's think about them as ounces. Okay. Um, but when you go into volume, see, now that makes no sense, though, to most people who think about buying things in bulk, right? Uh, anything you buy in bulk, you usually get, well, a better price, don't you? Yeah, but the gold market is different because it's suppressed. Mm -hmm. What they're doing, what the banker elite are doing, is allowing floor droppings to go to the dealers so the public does not wake up. The floor droppings are offered at a discount. They don't want to offer these de dealers, you know, hundreds and hundreds of coins because they'll – the people will will realize, oh, my gosh, the price is higher. The only way, I, I didn't say that well, the only way they would allow hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of coins to hit the dealers is if they do so at an $1,800 price. They're not going to do that. So it's like a, you know, it's like a currency loss leader. Let, okay. Let's throw onto the floor a bunch of $1,200 or $1,300 coins we're going to take a loss for them, but that's okay because we're going to fool the public into thinking that's the real price. And unfortunately for people who are, who are stuck with the plan of having to sell their precious gold coins in order to cover their monthly expenses, it's, it's, it's just tough for them. It's, it's not a great plan. It's tough for them. Uh, they cannot sell to the same people that the voice does. The voice told me a few days ago, yeah, uh, let, let's see if uh, that client is in a position to buy 10 tons. And, and one ton is $41.842 million. 10 tons is $420 million. Mm. 
Okay, so 12, 13, 14 tons is half a billion dollars. Okay, that's a good-sized gold purchase. And to buy that, you need the 80% premium. It's not so much an 80% premium. What you're doing is you're wiping out the 80% discount from the floor droppings that end up in dealer shelves. Wow. So what what does that mean for the guy who's, you know, painstakingly pulling together a small gold portfolio? What does that mean for him, though? It means he's doing very well buying at a great discount, Chuck. Mm -hmm. But he ain't able to buy many. Right. Okay, no, I, I get that part. But what I'm saying is, you know, when, when these things turn around... Right. Uh, when, when we have when we have the time when this could be, you know, cashed in, so to speak, and used, uh, what it, what does that mean for their position, though? You know, if you've only got these small amounts, I guess you get swallowed up in the in the larger, you know, in the in the larger framework, it feels well, like. I it mean, depends on whether these people really wanted to buy several hundred coins when they ended up only buying a couple dozen coins. I don't know how much money they have, Chuck. No, I got you. I mean, we're dealing with a lot of theoreticals here, but that is just a wild concept to me, though, that you're looking at an 80% premium when you're buying, you know, in mass quantity because that's the real price of gold, effectively. It, it's not – okay, if you're talking about television sets or, or cars or p car parts or anything like that, yeah, you get a discount. Why do you get a discount? Because the dealer has plenty full supply. And is willing to come down on his profit margin to make the sale because he knows he'll still be making a shitload of money. In the right. gold market, it's different. The supply is tight. So if you want to get that $100 million worth of gold, you got to pay up for a proper price. Mm. Because the gold dealers are getting floor droppings at a heavy discount. Now, go to a couple dealers and say, hey, look, is it possible to buy a million dollars worth? Because I, I've got a little investor group, and there are 18 of us, and we want to get a better price. Can you get us a million dollars worth of gold eagles? Just try it out with a couple of dealers. Mm. What you probably hear is, we think we can get 14. You know, it's the same story everywhere, Chuck. This is suppressed, floor droppings to the public. If you want to get something big, you got to pay up. It's not anything like this typical distribution wholesale. you got to pay the proper price. And there's not a whole lot. Okay, what idiot sitting on tonnage of gold is going to say, how oh, sure, you want to buy a few million bucks worth of gold? We got some nice bars for you. We know the price, it sure as hell ain't 1300 but we'll, we'll give you all you want. No, he's an idiot for thinking that. Right. The market is tight. He will tell you, well, I'll sell you a few million dollars worth, but you got to pay the proper price, asshole. But then when we turn to silver... Right. As you said, though, because that 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 almost appears to me to be a tighter situation because uh, there's less possession by the banks. Yeah. So doesn't that mean that in a way this is uh, probably the thing that uh, that people should be squirreling away? Even uh, I mean, I hate to say this, but shouldn't that be? Well, I guess, like you said in the original equation, 80 percent silver and 20 percent gold kind of makes a lot more sense. It sure does. Um, John Embry, I've actually met John Embry um, when I was part of the Cambridge House conference crew. That was between 2005 and 2008. It was a lot of fun. I did 15 different conferences. But John Embry of the Sprott Asset Group, um, John Embry did an article I think it was about five years ago. It was a great article. It was a unique article. And he said, just based on a supply argument, and you've know, you got to bring in demand at the same time, but he just wanted to put out there on a supply argument, there's 11 times as much silver tonnage 
produced annually in global mines compared to gold. Okay. Therefore, wouldn't it make sense that the ratio would be 11 to 1? Now, that's a pretty good argument. Now, let's bring in demand. <clears throat> mm. Industry has tremendous silver demand. It has very tiny gold demand. So wouldn't it make sense that the silver price be a lot more responsive to the huge demand? Therefore, wouldn't you think the 11 to 1 supply ratio would be an upper bound? That's where I think we might be heading in future years, but I don't want to get ahead of myself and get too aggressive because uh, the voice is, pounds the table every few months and says, Jim, you got to hear this, got to be clear. We're heading to $10,000 gold, we're heading to $400 silver, and we're heading to a 25 to 1 ratio. You got to hear this because this is where we're heading. And I, I think this is this is probably quite true. Um, you know, there's been a lot of stories <clears throat> lately about commitment of traders, COT, and JP Morgan, and showing up a lot of silver in in their their, their paper accounts. Uh, I got a theory about JP Morgan. It's kind of simple, but it has you know complex background. But the simple part is that JP Morgan, in my opinion is doing one of two things. I think it's more likely the first, that they're an agent supplying China with their silver stockpile that the Chinese have largely depleted since 2002 and three when they became uh, you know, a bit of an industrial power. Mm -hmm. And lately they've been a bigger industrial power. You don't become an industrial power without using your silver stockpile. So I think J.P. Morgan, as part of a complex sequence of events, has been hired as agent by China to supply the silver to China. Now, the complex element comes about when you factor in the 1999 most favored nation status given to China. And the U.S. asked and received, from what I understand, and the voice confirms this, who's on top of everything related to gold and silver, the Chinese were asked and they granted something on the order of 5,000, 6,000 tons of gold to the Wall Street banks on a lease. And we reneged on the lease. We broke the contract in 2007. And a little known fact, Chuck, if you're looking to see what actually happened in the middle of 2008, to precipitate the Lehman failure and the subprime bond explosion, just take a look at China. It's called Chinese vengeance. They sold their Fannie Mae bonds. They sold billions of Fannie Mae bonds. So my argument is that China, China got their vengeance to, to pinprick the subprime mortgage bond problem in the United States because we reneged and did not pay them back the lease gold because we sold it into the market. There's another element to that which Rob Kirby pieced together, and that had to do with the secure stream of the income taxes for the U.S. government, which the Chinese were smart enough to put in as collateral on the gold lease because we have a reputation of breaking treaties and breaking contracts and murdering people that we do deals with. <laughs> and the recession that happened in 06, 07, and 08 busted the Secure Stream IRS aggregate bond that was used to secure the gold lease from China to Wall Street. When that went bust, J.P. Morgan lost their headquarters to a Chinese conglomerate. When that happened, J.P. Morgan lost control of the Fed Gold Bank, gold bullion storage facility that's nuclear bomb-proof in South Manhattan. Mm. I reason very simply that J.P. Morgan became the Chinese bitch 
So when China wanted to replace and replenish their silver stockpile, they did nothing more than turn to J.P. Morgan's, their bitch, and said, we need help. Why don't you work your magic with the, the futures contracts and use your facilities that we own? Do your job, bitch. <laughs> Told their bitch to fetch, basically. <laughs> yeah, it, it's pretty interesting. Um, mm. So I think we're heading toward an explosive move in silver. It's interesting that Cliff High is indicating, you know, people need to understand this. And I'm not a real expert in uh, linguistics, frequencies and all, but uh, I do know what keywords are. I do know what frequencies are all about. It seems to me that Cliff High is indicating that there is a lot of Internet talk, chatter, and conversation and indication that the path is leading toward an explosive move in silver. Notice that I was very careful in not saying the forecast is for an explosive move in silver. No, the chatter, conversation, and indications are leading in that direction, which might be interrupted. Don't know. Mm. I don't know what's going to be interrupted. Well, no, look, a lot of trends seem to emerge, and then what happens is somebody artificially introduces uh, something into the equation, right? Uh, in a lot of cases, that's what happens regarding this stuff. Um, I'm being asked, actually, by a text uh, about your opinions about copper. Because um, this is emerging as a tradable metal as well, and I, I get the uh, industrial uses for it. Uh, never really thought of it much outside of you know. I mean, yeah, it's good for wiring, but I mean, it's not uh, not one of those things I usually consider in this conversation. Is is that something that could be added to somebody's portfolio too? Because it's a little more flexible, a little more useful, or is that just Nonsense. I, I would say that's not advisable because copper is an investment on the economies. And gold and silver is an investment on reform to the financial structures. And that's a big distinction. Mm, okay. I think it's very possible that we're going to enter an inflationary depression where the copper price might go down. But gold and silver, gold and silver go way up. Mm. Well, and there you go. And like you said, it's you know if it's coiled like that spring we're talking about, and it's being artificially suppressed, um, this would be the time for for especially the small purchaser to get in, uh, right? And oh man, the whole thing is just so. Just load up on silver. It's so simple. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's where my instinct has taken me for some reason is that th th this is the thing to do. Uh, doesn't matter how you do it, just get a hold of it as, as much as possible. Uh, you know, whether it's a coin, it's a bar, it's, uh, any of this stuff, as long as it's legit. I and, like a uh, thousand ounce bar. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thousand ounce silver bar. So divide by six, 16, what do you get? You know, 60 some pound bar. Right. That's a nice unit. No, That's going to do very well. I mean, a thousand ounce bar, what does that cost? Well, $17,000. It's pretty easy mathematics. <clears throat> you know, no. we, we've been wrecking the monetary system, Chuck, and uh, I want to get to, I want to get to a very interesting point here. Uh, you, you, we've been hearing a, a heretical argument against gold, that, oh, gosh, you can't have gold back all the money because there's too much money. There's not enough gold. Oh, what a bunch of bullshit that argument is. We have a five-fold increase in the dollar monetary base since Lehman. Has gold gone up five-fold? Because for about 30 years, gold went up pretty much in sync with the dollar's Money supply. So, we know that the opposite of, has happened. 2011, we saw a $1,900 price. Now we're, what, 30%, 40% lower than that. 
okay, so the argument is that there's not enough gold to cover, I'm sorry, yeah, not enough gold to cover all the dollars in a backing. Well, sure there is. Multiply the gold price by five, where it should be. <laughs> you know, let's do quickly what we did with the dollar since Lehman in 2008. We multiplied the dollar money supply by five. Let's multiply the gold price by five. There will be plenty of gold to cover that. Oh, my gosh, what a stupid straw dog mm. argument that is. But who's making the argument? The Wall Street banks and economists. They're full of shit. I think we're in a global reset countdown. And, you know, one of the most common questions I get, Chuck, is, what do you think is going to trigger this? We're going, to, we're going to get a breakdown. Something's going to break. I don't know where it's going to come from. Well, I actually well you know, thought that's, that's the thing. Hold on a second, because that is a key question. I know you get that question all the time, right, is what is going to set this off? Because we see trends this way, that way, the third way. Everybody is running and, and trying to determine, you know, different indicators, right? Um, we wound up talking about, you know, some of these short positions that we're seeing in the Wall Street, uh, you know, uh, uh, sphere at this point. Uh, earlier in the week, I talked to, with somebody about that, and it seems like it's an indicator for something that is being put into place now. Point is, we still don't know really what the trigger is that brings us to that point where maybe there is a complete reset. Maybe there is a need for, and isn't that the time that they're going to introduce, hey, look, now that everything is all screwed up, here's the new currency, here's the new trading standards, here's the new, and isn't that what everybody wants to know, really, is when are we going to see that? What is the, you know, what is the, uh, the, the, the foreplay before we get screwed on that one pretty much? What is it? Right? Um, and, and that's the big question all the time, isn't it? Yeah, it is. We really don't know where it's going to come from. Um, I, I like admitting my mistakes, Chuck. I'm, I'm funny like that. Because, you know, if you don't admit a, admit a mistake, you lose your credibility because everybody makes some. And if you don't learn from your mistakes, you might not learn much. So here's a mistake that I had made a year ago. I thought the Deutsche Bank was going to bring down the banking system and bring down maybe the derivatives and bring down maybe the dollar. Because if derivatives go, the control for the fake demand for the treasuries will, will disappear. And I was wrong. Um, here we are. Um, it, it's like Lehman Square. Deutsche Bank is so much bigger than Lehman Brothers. Mm. Um, it's sometimes called Lehman Square by some friends of mine. Deutsche Bank did not go down. Well, why not? Because the Euro Central Bank banded together with the Fed and made sure they pumped up I think, some hidden trillions. It doesn't cost the Fed and the Euro Central Bank anything to come up with two trillion, five trillion, ten trillion dollars. Their challenge is to prevent you from knowing about it. Mm. Doesn't cost them anything. Doesn't cost them a dime. They cannot let you know about it. They cannot let the public know about it. They cannot let the financial markets know about it. Because that would undermine the faith in, in the system. So Deutsche Bank, oh gosh, there was an analysis done by Investment Dynamics. The same guy did, did a Lehman Brothers analysis in 2007. And then in the aftermath, you know, the dead bodies were apparent with Lehman. He, he did another one and he found out that he had a two and a half to one ratio from his conservative calculations. I don't even care what his layman calculations were. All I care about is his ratio. Mm. His conservative ratio was two and a half times lower than what it should have been. Well, he did the same conservative kind of analysis to Deutsche Bank and found they had a minus 400 billion euro value. <laughs> wow. So multiply by two and a half to enter reality, or at least approximate a re reality, and Deutsche Bank is worth approximately minus one trillion euros. 
Okay, so why doesn't it fail? Well, they keep shoving in money, repairing with paper mache their failed areas. The Voice told me about three or four years ago, Deutsche Bank has seven or eight big businesses, you know, like uh, managing sovereign bonds, uh, commercial loans, uh, derivatives, etc., cetera, uh, gold and silver you know, rig markets, you know, gold, what do you call it, the gold fix, all these different areas of business. And, and he said, of the seven or eight, only two or three are making any money. The rest are all dead, insolvent, losing money, bleeding. And he told me a year and a half ago, Deutsche Bank doesn't have any profitable business line anymore. And they're at risk of going down, but he... He was different from me. He said, you know, Deutsche Bank could fail, but it really doesn't take much for them to paper it over. The risk to Deutsche Bank is not so much papering it over and, and having that exposed. The risk is not knowing where to paper it over. It could be so big and complex, he said, that they don't understand where the vulnerability lies. Think of a, think of a, of a big boat. And it's, it's not a streamlined vessel where you could just look down and, and see, you know, 200 yards, 200 meters down the, the side of the, of, of the craft. Imagine a very complex floating raft where you got nooks and crannies everywhere and you don't really know where a leak is coming from. That's the Deutsche Bank risk. Well, apparently they covered it. They, they're still covering it. And, and it looks like they're, they might be able to do the same thing with the Italian banking system, which was my other expected risk area, Chuck. Uh, I, I still right. think that Italy might be a bigger risk than Deutsche Bank right now for the site of the breakdown that causes a contagion for a very simple reason. The Italians are defiant. I mean, have, have you ever – I once had three best friends in Boston who were Italian. Andriozzi, Shira, and Amabile. And, you know, you get them angry and you better stand back. <laughs> and especially their wives. <laughs> that, that's, that's the trick right oh, there. I'm speaking yes, to Mr. Sir. Ocelli there. <laughs> You got to remember, as as angry and problematic as the men might be, <laughs> you don't piss <laughs> off the women. No, yeah. go ahead. Okay. Well, here's, here's the point, though. The Italians might say "f you" to the European Bank, European Central Bank, the European Union Commission, the European Monetary Union. They might say, "Screw all you guys. We're going back to the lira currency. We're going to assume our debts." And convert them, and and we're going to be on our merry way with a nice fat devaluation, so we can outcompete the rest of you idiot countries stuck in the European Monetary Union, which means European Euro currency, Euro currency, you know, the conglomerate of Euro currency users. Imagine if Italy gets off the euro, goes into the lira again, devalues by thirty percent, converts its its government debt into it, devalues. That government debt by 30%, so the French and German banks take a hit that cannot be avoided. Oh, my gosh, that is so big. The risk now is extending to France, Chuck, in a very interesting way, because the, Ch the French have done more homework. They've done more research than the Italians. The French have concluded that something like 60% of their French government debt can be moved to a French franc and be devalued and written down based mm. on Maastricht rules, EU guidelines, rules and regs, so that only 30% or 35% of their debt is new and under the euro currency umbrella, whereas the majority of almost two-thirds of the French government debt is pre EU pre euro currency and that can be pushed legally under the new French franc devalued and what a whack job that'll do for the German banks that hold 90% of the French government debt. Mm.
So we've got some big risks in Europe, not so much the United States. The United States is going to paper it over, paper it over, rig the markets, you know, kill a few more people in positions of, of opposition. I mean, we killed our way into control of the Brazilian government. Oh, many governments we killed our way into control of, you know, we by we, of course, not you and me, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, and you know what, Jim, we're coming down to just about the last 10 minutes here. And, you know, first of all, we, we haven't really talked about the hat trick. We haven't really talked about the website. Uh, and we also haven't really just sort of given people the general takeaway from all of this. So, uh, so I turn it to you to do, to do all of that if you, if you don't mind. Because, uh, you know, Jim, Jim is a, an incredible voice in and of himself. Uh, he obviously has these colleagues which advise him. And I, I love when you bring them up and you talk about certain things that go on between you guys. It, uh, it, it definitely is informative, especially, uh, you know, Look, I, I realize, you know, it's like cryptic names and everything else, but uh, but it seems to me as though the people that uh, Jim is talking with, his colleagues, uh, might even a lot of them know a lot more than Jim does <laughs> when it comes to certain things. Right. Uh, but I, but I love having you on this show, man. And I, I want to thank you again for uh, for coming on and uh, turn it over to you. OK, the, the takeaway is you better get ready for some problems with paper assets. You better get ready for a stock decline. You better get ready potentially even for a U.S. Treasury bond decline, meaning interest rates rise and principal values go down. Um, I, I, you got to load up for this. It's not going to be a rainy day. It's going to be a hurricane. It's going to take place in the next couple of years. It, it looks like Trump's progress is being slowed. He's got a number of players on his team who are advocates of the gold standard. They're just not going to be permitted to sit at the decision desks for a while. you got to load up on your gold and silver. And, and here's a strange piece of advice. If you've got a dealer who says, you know, I can get you a few extra gold coins, but it uh, might cost you a little more. Offer him 15, 20% premium and see how many more gold coins you can get. Because mm. the price is really 80% higher. Again, you're dealing with floor droppings. I'd like to make a comment on uh, David Rockefeller, one of the most diabolical figures in modern history. Um, he was a main researcher for a program called 2020 Project. And the goal was to download the human consciousness into a computer disk, you know, disk drive, storage. Uh, and, and you saw, there was a movie, it was funny, it was called Chappie. It was based in South Africa where a young kid, oh boy, boy this is not going to be how it happens. He just, you know overcame some obstacles in his living room on his little workstation and managed to download and, and make emotional capability for his robot. Oh, gosh. Okay, but it's a movie. <clears throat> you also saw it in, uh, I think it was called uh, uh, Vengadores. What are they? Oh, gosh. I, I, I can remember the name in the Spanish title. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the Avengers. The Avengers. The Vengadores. Um mm. There was a story about the uh, um, the Cobra, and the Cobra system had a, a human consciousness download of, of that little guy, short fellow with a you know funny looking little face and glasses. They downloaded his brain consciousness. Okay, what Rockefeller wanted to do was download his own brain and own consciousness steal another stronger body like in his 30s and upload his own consciousness after wiping clean the new body's brain. Okay, so I ask you, is he dead or was he downloaded? 
You're not the first person. You're not the first person to pose that question on this show. It was really weird. I, I didn't consider it until somebody brought that up, and I said, "Wow, imagine that for a moment. Maybe this guy is still walking around." Well, <laughs> in a different body, you might yeah. find. You know, in, in five years, some other figure has come forward, and he's really nasty. But uh, here's a joke I heard in, in a close. Um, he, he was on ice. The son of a bitch was on ice in Antarctica for something like two or three months. And they just pulled the plug. But here's a joke. The rumors are that he took a few trillion dollars with him to hell. In, in protective luggage so that the heat wouldn't burn it up. And I wonder, maybe he took some gold. But you know, at, at 2,500 degrees Celsius, it melts down. It, it turns into a gas. It's just, you know. <laughs> I don't know what the temperature of hell is, but I sure hope he's finding out. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I, I don't even think gold could survive in hell. So guess what? <laughs> you know, the, 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 this guy, it, it's amazing. The, the second that the news flash came out, I was inundated with messages of celebration and so on and so forth. And I wondered at that time, Jim, if, if it even matters because somebody else is going to step into that vacuum. Uh, you know, and, and I think that the game is going to continue until the game is done. Well, we got some more figures, more names that belong right behind Rockefeller heading to hell. And you, you can't bury these people six feet down. You got to make it at least 15 to 20 feet. Uh, I'd like to see Papa Bush. Uh, I'd like to see Rothschild. I'd like to see Soros, Clinton. Uh, apparently there was a, a memorandum or some kind of a recorded conversation by Trump, he actually made a decision, you know, leave the Clintons alone because the best medical opinions are now indicating that they won't be among us, either one of them, in 2018. Mm. And the debate is over whether they deserve a state funeral. And I don't know that Clinton does, but the fact that he was president probably means that it's going to happen. But for Hillary to get a state funeral, for me, is an absolute effing joke. Now, Bill, Bill, I don't think we could avoid. But Hillary, on the other hand, uh, I think we could. That, that could be an, an easily made judgment call. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. I'm with you there. There's just too many dead bodies uh, just in the last year. And there's another dead body, a 34-year-old heart attack uh, in the Clinton Hillary Clinton wake. Uh, because he was scheduled to testify before the Congress the next day. All right, so where's the typewritten suicide note? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, good luck with that. Uh, you know, I, I, I love the Facebook meme that came out at one point of a crushed squirrel under, under a tire, and 